Did you know that there was a time before cell phones? Prior to the cell phone, we were locked down to what we called landlines, tethered to the wall, unable to text message or access the internet or move around while we're communicating with the people around us. But then enter the cell phone. The first cell phone was invented in 1973, and it wasn't even available for a retail purchase until 1984. So some of your parents, if you're a high school student, may remember uh, the invention of the first cell phone being announced, and uh, most, if not all, of your parents did not have a cell phone when they were your age in high school. Um, and check this out. Here is a picture of the first retail cell phone from 1984, the Motorola Dynatac 8000X phone. This gigantic brick phone uh, sold for a whopping $3,995. It weighed two pounds and the battery life was, get this, 30 minutes long. You don't know how good you have it, kids, right? Um, in 1992, IBM announced the first smartphone and it wasn't a kind of smartphone that you have in your head right now. Um, it wouldn't be available for purchase for another two years, but um, it was called the Simon Personal Communicator. It had a touch screen that you had to use a stylus to access. It had a one hour battery life updated and sold for only $1,100, but it only worked in 15 US states. And at that point, cell phones got better and smaller with longer battery lives as the years progressed. In 1997, um, Nokia the, released the 6100, um, which was the first phone with a game called Snake. Now, if you've never played Snake, then you have never lived. Go Google that and figure out how to play that. Uh, in the year 2000, a company called Sharp released the JSH04, which was the first cell phone to have a camera. The camera took pictures just over 100,000 pixels in size, whereas the standard iPhone 14 Pro today takes pictures at 48 million pixels. Get that. Uh, finally, in 2001, a Japanese company called NTT uh, Docomo uh, launched the first 3G network, giving cell phones internet capabilities. And then on January 9th, 2007, the world changed forever. Check this out. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one, is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. The iPhone was released in 2007. For some of you, you were just babies. For others of you, you were not even born yet. Between 1973 and 2007, the cell phone evolved drastically. The cell phone went from a communication device to adding games, to adding cameras, to adding the internet, to adding apps. The cell phone today is nothing like the cell phone of 1973. Now, what if I told you? I want you to trade your iPhone or your Android or whatever phone you have today, um, and I want you to start using the 1994 retail version of the Motorola DynaTAC 8000X. What would you think? No more TikTok, no more YouTube, no more Instagram on your phone, no more texting, no more weather app, no more internet, uh, 30 minutes of battery life on that phone. Now, some of you may be like, I don't have a phone anyway. That's probably very few of you. Some of you may enjoy that for a brief season, but I would assume that most of you, if I had you make that trade, would not be happy because you've moved beyond 1984. 
not naturally you weren't even born yet. Um, the ancient brick of the past is not uh, the same idea that you have of a cell phone today. Your idea of a cell phone is much more advanced, it's much more powerful, it's much better for your life in today's world. Switching from your amazing smartphone to the inferior Motorola that we showed you before um, would slow you down. It would severely limit you. It would hold you back because the real concept of the cell phone we have today is a much better concept of a phone than they had back in 1973 or 1984 when the retail phone was available. Uh, real Life Nation, here's where I'm going with this. I think many people have adopted an inferior way of thinking about Christianity. It's a way of thinking about Christianity that's slow, it's limited, it, is, it holds you back. And if I asked you, what does it mean to be a Christian? What would you say? Really think about that. If I were to ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian? What would your answer be? Now, I've been a pastor for over 16 years, and so I've heard every answer to this question. It means going to church. It means I go to heaven when I die. It means I read my Bible and I try to pray. It means I try to be a good person. It means I try not to sin. The list goes on. Lots of examples of answers like that. But guys and girls, if your answers are those or something like that of what it means to be a Christian, that's like thinking about a cell phone the way you saw it in 1984 through those pictures. True, it is a cell phone. It did function as a cell phone, but that's not the best version of what a cell phone is. And yes, those things are describe what Christian, those answers that you add to that question do describe what maybe Christians do, but that's not the best version of what it means to be a Christian. The real understanding of Christianity is so much better than all of those really small, short, uh, kind of surface level definitions of what it means to follow Jesus. And I'm not saying that to be insulting if that's what you had thought of when I asked you that question of what it means to be a Christian. I'm saying this because whoever gave you that definition of Christianity is wrong. Christianity is so much more and it's so much better than those lifeless definitions. So if you ran into somebody carrying one of those old brick phones today that were from 1984, you would hopefully tell them, man, there is something so much better for you than what you have in your hand right now. And guys and girls, there is something so much better for you when it comes to understanding Christianity than what so many people might have caused you to believe. The concept that some people have about Christianity is it's slow, it's outdated, it's lifeless, it's limiting, it holds you back from the amazing life that God has in store for you, that Jesus wants you to live. And if you've been with us over the course of this series, if something is holding you back from your faith, we're not supposed to sit there and take it, are we? We're supposed to get up and break stuff right? That's our series, Break Stuff. Welcome to the final installment. The first week, we broke down our idols. The second week, we broke through barriers. Last week, we broke out of chains. This week, we're going to get a little more symbolic, a little more figurative in our Break Stuff uh, week this week. Um, this week, we break into new life. Now, this is a perfect follow-up from last week, Breaking Out of Chains. And if you haven't caught that, scroll back and, and, and check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, this is a perfect follow-up because after you break out of chains, and, and what that was was breaking out of sin, patterns of sin, those things that weigh you down. Now it's time to really break into not what you don't do, but what you do, the life that God has for you. Now, all throughout the New Testament and the Bible, we see examples of people who move from a place of not knowing Jesus and who he is to meeting him and discovering him, learning who he is and what he's about. And in every encounter that you see that in the New Testament of the Bible where people have with Jesus, here's what you don't see happen. You don't see people say, believing in Jesus means being a good person. You'll never see that. You don't see people meeting Jesus and saying, to be a Christian, I just need to go to church once a week, right? You don't see that happen. You don't see people experience Jesus and say, I can do whatever I want as long as I just pray and ask Jesus to forgive me and then I could go to heaven when I die. You don't see that happening in any interaction with Jesus. You don't see people meet Jesus and say, Jesus is okay, but um, I'll just fit him into whatever part of my life I think he fits into best. You don't see that happening. So many of the answers that people give today about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be a Christian are just, are just boring. They're old, they're limiting, they're lifeless. Some answers, um, uh, some of those answers are so far below the real meaning of what it looks like and what it means to follow Jesus with your life because Jesus has so much more to offer you. When people meet and follow um, and come to know Jesus with their life in the Bible, there are two things that happen. One is that they reject Jesus. They just say, you're not who I want you to be. You don't, I don't want you in my life. 
or they accept him. And the Bible says that they enter into new life, a forgiven life, a transformed life, a purposeful life, a renewed life, a supernatural life. People break out of patterns of sin. They are set free from addiction. You stop being a jerk. You stop being weighed down by greed. You stop giving into lust. You don't hold, you're not held down by sin in your life. And it's not even just about you. See, the Bible shows that people who come to know Jesus, meet Jesus, and start to find their new life in Jesus, they don't just have new life for themselves. They turn around and they bring God's new life to others. They feed the hungry. They clothe the naked. They visit the lonely. They bring grace and truth to those all around them. They bring joy and peace wherever they go. They spread kindness and encouragement to everyone. So in real life nation, if you think Christianity is just some slow, boring, irrelevant, you know, belief system that has no impact on your life, doesn't impact you. It's purposeless, purposeless. It doesn't transform you in your words and your actions. Then you have the wrong view of Christianity. And might I suggest you might not even have Christianity at all. Your understanding of Christianity is holding you back and it's time to break into new life. So how do we do that? How do we break into new life? How do we move from this, this dated, out, like just lifeless description of Christianity into the vibrant, life-giving view that God wants you to have of what it means to follow Jesus. Let's see if there's a, a passage of the Bible. There's plenty of them, but there's a, let me see if I can focus on one passage of the Bible that can help you out in this. Um, I'm going to read to you from the book of Colossians in the New Testament of the Bible from chapter 3. Here it goes. It says, since you have been raised to new life in Christ. That's it, right in our statement right there. You've been raised to new life in Christ. Now, set your sights on the realities of heaven. And here's the main reality of heaven. It's a place where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Now, here's the first thing that you need to do to break into new life. Make heaven a reality on earth. Now, there's passages like this that I just read and all throughout the Bible where people too often take it the wrong way. Uh, you may have just heard that I just read, you know, set your sights on the realities of heaven. And most people, when they hear that, they think of a future destination. They think that means that we're going to go through our life just as is and just think that one day when I'm dead and gone, I will be in heaven with Jesus when I die and everything will be great. This life doesn't matter. Just put your hope in the next life in heaven. Now, I do believe in heaven. I do believe it's real. And yes, I do believe that heaven is going to be awesome. But that's not what this passage and others that like it are saying. It's not saying just wait out this life and let it be just whatever everyone else makes it to be. And one day everything is going to be so much better in heaven. That's that. This is saying right here, right now, how you live the new life and break into the new life God has for you is to set your sights on heaven now. Jesus himself said this in, in teaching his disciples how to pray. He said in Matthew 6, he said uh, to God, he said, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not just in heaven, but bring that here and now. See, God created this world originally to be a paradise. We read that right at the start from the Bible that human beings, um, he created this world to be a paradise, but human beings stopped trusting in God. They turned away from him and followed their own way instead. Um, and and they, they now sin has destroyed uh, the perfect world that God had created, the world that he intended for us to live in. So living a Christian life, among other things, is an invitation from God to partner with him to restore the original intent of the paradise that God has for this life right now. It's an invitation to a partnership with God to bring new life to you, to those around you, and to this world. But for those of you who are Christians, we can get so distracted with so many other things in this life. We get wrapped up in ourselves or uh, get wrapped up in what the culture around us is telling, is telling us is important. We chase after money, chase after power, chase after pleasure, chase after fame, uh, you name it. We chase after it and we get distracted by it. We get so wrapped up in this world um, and what really everyone else is doing that we can simply just live like everyone else around us, like the rest of the world around us, when God has so much more in store for us. This passage mentioned the realities of heaven and said heaven is where Jesus sits in honor at God's right hand. 
Now, what this is saying is this is more of like a royalty term that we might not understand living in our culture today if you're watching this from the United States. Um, but this is talking about heaven as, in terms of like a, a kingdom, in terms of, of rule and royalty. It's saying that heaven is where Jesus is honored and in a place of power and control. Now, this is why so many people don't truly break into the amazing life that God has for them. Instead of honoring Jesus and putting him in a place of respect and power and control and authority that, that he really deserves for our life, they give Jesus an hour once a week at church. Or maybe they say they believe in God, but they really just live for themselves. They, they don't make heaven a reality in their lives and in the world around them. And you have, you, I want so much more for you than that, than just, than just living for what this, this lifeless de description of Christianity is about because Jesus has so much more. I want you to break into new life, to set your sights on the realities of heaven where Jesus is in his proper place in your life and partner with him to make heaven a reality here on earth. And let's keep reading because this passage gives another way to make those heavenly realities uh, come to life in and around you. Check it out. It goes on to say this. It says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an adulterer, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior, slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your own sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And the last part is what I want you to focus on. Because here's the next point I want you to remember. To break into new life, learn to know your creator. It's easy to read this passage and get wrapped up in a bunch of don'ts, right? And we think this way when we think about the Bible so often. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't sin. Don't do anything that we you know, naturally maybe want to do. When we think of Christianity that way, about a bunch of don'ts, we make this life in Jesus about everything we don't do, which, which that's not new life. That's not amazing life. That's not a great life at all. What I want to point out is that this, what this last verse says, after all the don'ts, it says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Whenever you come upon don'ts in the Bible, you may have had a bad taste in your mouth when it comes to that. But here's how I want you to think about that when you read it from now on. The Bible doesn't list things you shouldn't do, all right? You might, that, that, yes, it just did, but no, just think about it this way. The Bible doesn't list things that you shouldn't do. The Bible is listing things that God doesn't do. Have you ever thought about it that way? The Bible is listing things that God doesn't do. God isn't greedy. God isn't lustful. God doesn't lie. God doesn't cheat. He doesn't tear people down with his words. And the goal for Christianity is to become more like God. So it's not about don'ts, it's really about do's. Even the don'ts are about what you are supposed to do, which is become like God. So what I wanna challenge you to do to live into this new life God has for you is to get to know him, get to know your creator. So I talk to so many people, both adults and students who think Christianity is all about what you do what you, and what you don't do. But really, if you wanna break into new life, don't make it about that. Make your life about a consistent journey to gradually get more acquainted with the God who created you and the God who loves you so that you could become more like him. And as you get to know your creator more, you move from realizing the things that God doesn't do to discovering the things that he does do. And so check out how this passage says it. The passage goes on to word like this. It says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves in tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances uh, to, uh, for each other's faults and give one another, give uh, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. And this passage shows us another way to break into new life. Clothe, clothe yourself in God's character. 
Now, I was trying so hard. I, I feel like that's a weird way to phrase it. Clothe yourselves in God's character. And I was trying really hard to think of another way to word that that might be a little more uh, you know, relevant to, to us today, but it feels like uh, when I keep thinking about it, when I kept thinking about it, this felt like just the most clear way and the best way to say it. So we break into new life when we clothe ourselves in the character of God. And think about what it means to, to clothe yourself. When you put on clothes, you intentionally put something on for a purpose. You do it to keep warm or you do it to stay cool. You do it maybe to look cool or you do it to just look comfortable or be comfortable. You, you dress in clothes to play a sport you, or you dress up to go to something formal like a wedding. Also, when you put on clothes, you can identify with something. You know, for instance, you know, a basketball player like Steph Curry, he clothes himself in a Golden State's Warrior uniform because it identifies him with the team he plays for. They also pay him a lot of money to do that, so that's why he puts that on, but that's a different story. Um, so a Christian is supposed to clothe themselves with the character of God so that what's visible is everything that God is, and we identify with him. We purposefully put on his love. We purposefully put on his joy and put on his peace. We purposefully put on the character traits of God to partner with him, like we already mentioned, to purposefully make heaven a reality on earth. And we clothe ourselves in God because we identify with him. If you claim to be a Christian, that means something. And when you clothe yourself in the character of God, you actually live in that identity of your creator, of the God who loves you. And when you clothe yourselves in that, you help, you help break yourself into the new life God has for you and help show others how to break into that new life as well. And when people learn who God is, when you learn who God is and you start to clothe yourself in his character and partner with him to make heaven a reality on earth, it is going to be anything but lifeless. Christians clothed in the character of God, uh, they've created the first hospitals. Look it up. They've created the first orphanages. They led the charge for leading um, civil rights, for getting you know, civil rights uh, enacted in this country. Christians have dedicated their lives to fighting poverty. Christians living in the new life, in the character, clothed in the character that God has for them, don't just sit back and let the world go to hell, right? They, go, they step up and they make heaven a reality on this earth. And that's what I want for your life. That's what I want for you. I want you to have so much more than the tame, boring, lifeless definition of Christianity that so many people uh, have today. I want the amazing life that God has for you to shine through in your life. So now as we close, um, I want to issue a challenge for you tonight. Here, here's this a question that I want to challenge you to think about right now. Are you living in the new life God has for you? If you're a Christian, are you living in that new life? If you're not a Christian, do you maybe want that new life that God has for you? I started off uh, this message talking about the cell phones from 1973. They're so much different than your smartphone that you're holding or watching with in 2023. Who would ever choose the cell phone from 1973 when you could have something so much better for your life? I think so many Christians have a limited and lifeless understanding of, of following Jesus. They're picking something that's just so outdated and, and lifeless and boring and wrong. It's limited. It's had no impact on your life, and it really doesn't do anything. But Christianity is so much more than that. That's not the life God has for you. God has so much more. So right now, um, what I want us to do is symbolically take a hold of this new life that God has for you, all right? Um, if you're tired of whatever is limiting you and holding you back um, from the life that Jesus has for you and following him, I want to challenge you to start today to break into new life life. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, at, if you're with us in person, I'm going to show you what we're doing, but I'm going to, and I'm going to give you what you can do at home. Um, we're not necessarily breaking stuff today, but we are going to burn stuff. So if you are at home, I want to challenge you to be as safe as you possibly be. And possibly you may not want to burn something. Maybe you just write this out and rip it up instead of burning it up. But here's what I'm showing you. To do. We're, we're going to burn something today right here. I've got a piece of tissue paper. And if we're breaking into new life, we're making the decision to live in the reality of what following Jesus is all about. It's, making he it's bringing heaven, making a reality on earth, clothing ourselves in the character of God. It's, it's, it's living for him in the life that he has for you. So it, it, right now, what I'm going to do is I, I had already written this out just to prepare it. I wrote the date, 4-5-23, April 5th, 2023. And I wrote, today, I break into my new life in Jesus. And so what I'm going to do is I'm challenging you, maybe write that on your own piece of paper and, um, and crumple it up or fold it up or rip it up. Um, because right now you're getting out with the old and in with the new, out with the old life and into the new life that God has for you. And so in my symbolism right now for myself, 
on this date, I want to make sure that I'm going to be living this new life that God has for me. And I'm going to lay this out right here. I'm going to make sure. I saw this. I saw a demonstration of this, so hopefully it works, right? Uh, so I'm going to lay this out right here. I'm going to set it on fire and watch the old life go away to make way for the new life. that God has for me. So feel free at home to write out today's date. Today's the day that you are going to stop living in an old, boring, limited view of Christianity and start living in the new life that God has for you. Today you can start into something brand new and know that God has so much in store for you from here on out. Let me pray for you as we close. God, I pray, Lord, that anybody here who has just uh, heard about Christianity or even would claim to be a Christian themselves would understand that, uh, man, so many people hold just a, a tame, boring, lifeless view of what it means to follow you. If all it is to be a Christian is to attend church once a week for an hour, that's not what I want for my life. And I know that's not what you want for our lives either. You want us to break out of what's tame. You want us to move into uh, living our lives to get to know you better, living our lives to make heaven a reality on this, on this earth. You want to see us move into uh, something new and amazing. So God, I pray, Lord, that students and, and any adults even listening today are inspired by the life that you have for them. And I pray that they commit today from here on out to living their lives for you and the new life that you have for them. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon.